This week on People with Passion for Pets, we talk to Myra Markley. Myra is a dog trainer specialized in teaching dog owners to train their own service dogs. And she recently published her first book titled Managing Mutts, Training a Focused Canine. Yes, she is. Hi, Myra. Hey, Myra. Hello. How are you guys? Good, good. good. Welcome to People with Passion for Pets. <laughs> Thank you for having me on. So Myra, you, you are a dog trainer and you specialize in helping people train their own service dogs. And then recently you published a book and it's called Managing Mutts, Training a Focused Canine. And so that's, um, we're excited to have you on the show because that's a really a great book. It is going to be so great for people out there because, you know, we know that people have to wait years to get a service dog. Yes, I, I, I wrote it because I really wanted to help people learn to train their own dogs because it does take years sometimes to get a fully trained service dog. And then even once you get a fully trained dog, sometimes the bonding with the new person doesn't always work very well because they're so used to working with the trainer. So my book is to help you learn what to do so you can train your dog and therefore everyone's trained all at the same time and you're you're bonded with your dog because you've been doing it from the beginning it just makes for a better working relationship so say, and you can go at your own pace with the book if you want to work on specific parts you go to those chapters if you want to do something else you go to that chapter and then each chapter is broken up into different levels of difficulty so you start at the easy stuff and then maybe you stop for a while then go back to it when you're ready for the more advanced stuff so on the uh, on the cover of your book, uh, it shows you with uh, with a German Shepherd. Is that your dog? Yeah, that was my Raven. Unfortunately, she passed away back in June. Oh, I'm sorry mm -hmm. to hear that. And so, what dog do you have now? Uh, right now, I have she's a uh, giant Schnauzer Poodle mix, standard Poodle mix, and uh, she was my you know dog in training. You know, while while Raven was working, and of course now Zena's in charge. <laughs> well, that's cool. So do you try to get uh, two dogs at a time so one can train the other one as they're up and coming type of thing? Usually, yes. When one's a couple of years from retirement or, or just starting to slow down is a, is a good time to start looking for another one. That way they can kind of help teach each other what to do. Now, in your book, you also uh, have a very interesting story on how you got started as a dog trainer and, and uh, trained your first service dog. Can you share that with our audience? Oh, sure. Uh, yeah, it was, uh, well, you know, years and years ago, before I had a dog, of course, and I was grocery shopping and bringing my groceries into the house and trying to get everything put away, and I dropped a bottle of ketchup on the floor. I mean, it was sealed up. It wasn't going to break, but I could not pick it up. I can't bend down and get it, and all my little grabby tools were not working because it was heavy and awkward and, you know, slick plastic. I, I tried grabby things. I tried hooking little strings around it and like lassoing it. And I tried sweeping it up into the, into the little dustpan and the dustpan broke. I mean, it was, it was a disaster. It sat there on the floor for about three days before I finally gave up. And I called my, uh, one of my, my relatives over to come pick it up off the floor for me. And of course, during that time, I'm thinking, you know, if I just had a dog here, the dog could have just picked it up and given it back to me. So that was when I started looking for a dog and figured, eh, Sure, how hard could that be to train a dog? Right. Yeah, that was a lot more work than I thought it was going to be. But it was an excellent learning experience. That's so cool. And uh, tell us a little bit about your first dog. Uh, Sandy, she was a golden retriever. I actually found her at the pound, Maricopa County Animal Care and Control. And uh, yeah, I, I was surprised. A purebred golden there. And she was crazy. She was she was a young pup. She was about 10 months old. I mean, and she... She, she tore up my house, she ripped up my couch, tore up my, my, my carpet in the living room. She had terrible separation anxiety. I, mean, I couldn't even go to the mailbox, but, and it's just right at, right at my driveway without her tearing something up in us. And I couldn't put her in a kennel because you know she got kind of traumatized being in the kennels of the pound. So I had to kennel train her to where she wouldn't you know make her little paws all bloody trying to break out all the time. So I, I only, I mean, I adopted her like on a, a Monday and by Wednesday, we were enrolled in, in, in classes at PetSmart because I really had no clue what I was doing back then. 
And I, I learned a lot. Luckily, my uh, my my trainer was also her her mother had done service dogs, and she had had some experience with service dogs. So I later hired her as a personal private trainer to help teach me what I needed to do to get that not only to make that dog not so crazy, but to be a service dog for me. And it was a lot of work. I made a lot of mistakes, but boy, I learned a lot from it, which was fantastic because it's helped me help other people avoid some of the same mistakes. That's amazing. That is, that is really something. So you didn't just start out with an easy one. You, you got like baptized right away. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I just jumped in. <laughs> didn't really have a clue what I was doing, but I figured it out. Did everything the hard way, which is probably the best way to do it. You know, and I'm, I'm with you on that one because when, when your dog does something, um, people should learn from that, you know, and that's what us as trainers, every time we see a dog do something out of the box, it's a training solution for us, you know, why, exactly. what, how do you fix it, whatever. So you just got immersed off the deep end. There was no shallow wandering in for you. <laughs> that's Exactly. And but it that's, was good because I, I enjoyed the challenge. I've always liked challenge. And she made me think and she made me, made me problem solve and be like, you know, I was like, dog, what do you need? I had to learn how to listen to her so that I could figure out how to communicate with her. And that's, that's awesome. what makes, that's what makes good trainers is when you can communicate with them to say, okay, why are you doing this? You know, because they mm -hmm. obviously don't speak human. So it's, you know, that's where a good trainer comes out and they look at it and go, okay, what are the, what are the opportunities here? And then how do we exactly. fix them? That's very cool. That's very cool. So let's talk about the dog. So uh, what kind of dogs can do this? Are there any specialty breeds or I, obviously well, the book says much. So I think just about anybody can do it exactly. as long as they can reach the item that they're looking for, right? <laughs> exactly. Any breed of dog can be a service dog. It just depends what you need the dog to do. If you need a dog for stability and bracing, you need a nice, big, sturdy dog, not a chihuahua. You know, if you need a dog that's going to retrieving, you know, you want something that kind of has a natural inclination for it. But again, just about any dog can be to do that as long as you make it fun for the dog. And then when it comes to medical alerts, they don't have to be very big dogs. They can be little dogs they carry around with them if they want. Whatever works. That's very cool. Very cool. So the title is Managing Muds. Um, so do you find that, because you're referring to muds, that um, not purebred dogs are uh, really good for service dog training, or does it matter? It really doesn't matter. It's just that most of the dogs that I started off working with were all rescues from the pound, and very few were ever purebreds. But, you know, purebreds are great, too. I work with a lot of those as well. Now, so not so much the breed, but I'm assuming the temperament is very important when you choose a dog to be a service dog? Oh, definitely. You need to find a dog that's confident, but yet still wants to be with people and be a people pleaser, not confident and wants to do its own thing. Just like you also don't want a dog that's terrified of the world and just wants to hide in your lap the whole time, because that won't be very useful. You would need an old service dog for a service dog, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> now, is your uh, is your book also covering some of these topics? Uh, a little, yes. It's mostly about the training, but it, I do talk a lot about temperament, finding the right for the job, and of course, making the job fun for the dog. You know, you don't force your dog to do something it just doesn't want to do because it just won't do it. A lot of my clients, you know, they need the dog to do the job, whether they're telling it to do it or not. The dog has to want to do it. And if the dog doesn't want to do it, it's not going to do it. <laughs> that, that makes sense. Now, one of the things that spoke to me in your book is you talk about motivation. And it didn't just say motivate the dog, but it also said motivate yourself. So I'd love to talk a little bit more about that. Um, how do you motivate yourself to get your dog to do training with your dog? I always recommend start off with something kind of fun that you're kind of excited. And even if it's something simple, like just teaching your dog to like, you know, run through a tunnel or jump through a hoop or something, just if something that you think would be kind of cute and fun to do, you do it with your dog, teach your dog how to do it. And that's how you start building your motivation. But of course, if your dog is also just motivated by food, well, you know, you dangle the little treat out in front of the dog and be like, hey, you go do that. I'll give you this, you know, blow bribery. <laughs> But as long as you're having fun doing it and the dog's having fun doing it, you'll usually be very successful. 
Now you also talk obviously about uh, motivating the dog. And one of the things that I love is that you, you want uh, the owners to try different things because at different times during the training, different things can be motivating, right? Mm -hmm. That's true. Whether it be treats, praise, is loving sometimes just doing the activity is motivating enough i mean I, some dogs just love to they love to climb jump so maybe they'll do a couple of simple exercises and you can reward the dog by letting them you know jump up and down off the couch a few times or something, whatever it is the dog wants to do very cool so if somebody were wanted to get into uh actually starting their own service dog what would you recommend before they go out to the shelter or go get a purebred? What what do you think the prerequisites for them to do before they actually get started in something like that if they don't have a dog? You need to really figure out what kind of dog they want and what they're going to want the dog to do ultimately. And then you have to try to find a dog that physically meets those requirements. And then you got to go out and start looking at dogs. And then, of course, decide, do you want a lot of hair? Do you want not so much hair? Do you want to do a lot of grooming? Because, again, the type of dog coat, you know, that's a, the, the coat the dog has, it might be too much maintenance for the person. You never know. And then, of course, after you figure out size and temperament, then you got to go out there and try to meet the dogs. And you want the dog that wants to be with you, wants to engage with you, not the dog that's hiding in the corner. So I always tell people, you know, you go in there, you, you play with all the dogs for a few minutes, and then you stand there and just wait and just see which dogs run off to go play with the other dogs and which dogs kind of hang around you like, well, you're kind of cool. What else can we do? You want that dog. So where would you, um, so if you're looking for something like that, could you go to like rescues, um, people that, that have them in their homes and stuff that are rescues, and you could probably tell them, this is what I'm trying to accomplish. Do you have a dog like this, that the personality, the temperament, and the size? Yes, you can totally do that. Not a lot, of, not all the rescue people that you know house the dogs or foster the dogs, they don't always really understand how the dog's personality and temperament really is. They think they do, but you know, they're all oh, the dog just, you know, loves to play, play, play. I was like, yes, but does the dog really engage with you or does it just play with you? They, they kind of know the dog's personality, but they, or they get to know the personality as it relates to them, not to somebody the dog doesn't know. So the dog might be very outgoing with people that get knows, but the dog walks in, the dog runs and hides in the corner. Right. It's kind of an important thing to know too. How does it take the dog up to somebody? Does the dog adjust to change very well? And that's just questions that are harder to answer. So time-wise, I'm guessing this is pretty subjective, but what can people expect or, or look forward to if they start their training? I guess it depends on how much how much they put into it, but is there like a, a time that they might go, okay, I start seeing some results and this is kind of cool, like really getting into it? Uh, you can start seeing results pretty quick, but uh, on average, it takes between a year and two years to really, really train a service dog. A little bit longer if you're working with it from a young puppy because it just they have to wait for their little brains to mature at some point because they're just too young. But if you start off with a dog that's already like you know 10, 11 months old, it's already a lot of the puppy stuff and you can go a little bit faster. Well, and, and as we're talking service dogs, I mean, I'm sure anybody in our audience that has seen a working dog out with somebody. Um, it's not just about the task that the dog has to perform for that person, but it is also a lot about socialization and learning skills of being, you know, out in the environment and, and other things like, you know, not obviously not being reactive to other dogs or, mm -hmm. you know, being able to focus, like the title of your book says, it has to be a focused dog, correct? That's, that's correct. Yeah. That, that's where a lot of like the, uh, the temperament and the confidence comes in. Because you don't want a dog that is going to react to everything it sees. It needs to, you know, be exposed to it and be like, oh, okay, yeah, that's no big deal. I'm not going to worry about it. Or if I do have a question, I should look to my owner as to what do I do, not just run off or start barking. Right. And that's just that's just dog personality. And it, it you have to it's, it's hard to find a dog like that. And some of that is a little bit of training. You take them out, you expose them to something, you work with them while they're out around these objects or anything that's scary. So they realize that it's really not a big deal. And it's still better to stay focused on your person because your person will take care of you. 
So is that something that you would start first? Like, do you socialize the dog first and make sure that they can perform out with a lot of distractions? Or do you first teach the dog certain skills that you need or tasks that you need the dog to perform for you? Usually I start off with just teaching the dog basic communication, which is like the first three chapters in the book. It's in there, it's like three sections of it. You've established communication with the dog, so the dog understands what you're kind of saying, and you're understanding what the dog is saying, then you start socializing out a bit more. Because if you just go out places, the dog has no clue what's going on, doesn't have a clue what you're saying, doesn't have any confidence in your ability to understand what it's saying, you're, it's just a recipe for disaster. So you always start off with just basic obedience and communication. And then you start exposing your dog to, to small things and see how they handle it and then slowly build up and escalate until you get into, you know, bigger crowded situations. But the entire time you keep working on obedience, obedience, obedience. So the dog knows what to do, even in unknown situations. And that really speaks, uh, I think, to us, too, as you know, we're dog trainers as well. Um, because that, you know, we always feel that structure, if the dog knows that he can rely on you and you're his safe place, then he obviously is much more confident out in, uh, you know, public situations. Exactly. Yeah. The dog needs to, to know what's expected of it and, and how to react when something unexpected does happen. So as far as building a foundation, that's a good segue into obedience is if somebody has a dog or, uh, wants to get a dog, they could start out with some uh, uh, canine good citizen or some kind of basic obedience class to get yep. started, to give them a good good starting um, spot. So if they get the obedience under control, then they can go, okay, now I can focus on the service dog part. Exactly. That's what I always try to do too. Focus on the obedience and, and a little bit, you know, outside out in public, but usually dog friendly places just to get them exposed to stuff. But I always like whenever I take like students out with me, I always make sure they've actually completed the canine good citizen before we really go places that dogs are generally not allowed. Like you started out the conversation and saying you have to learn how to communicate with your dog and your dog has to learn to communicate with you. And I think obedience is a great way to establish some of the foundations of that. Yes, it is. Yeah, I. I I always recommend at least the canine good citizen. Most of the dogs that I work with, we also do the, the urban and the advanced test as well. And then of course the public access test and everything else that service dogs need to go through. Which right. any, anybody with a dog ought to do anyway, just to have a nice well-balanced dog to go out in public. Oh yeah, no, I totally agree with that too. <laughs> There's a, a now, lot of people out there that have dogs that have no clue how to behave. Yeah, <laughs> and you know, I think that's always one of the things um, that probably people kind of wonder is how do you get a dog to to be focused on you and and you know because as a service dog they kind of have to ignore other people they don't necessarily are supposed to right interact or get all excited when they see another dog so how do you teach some of those um, behaviors to a dog well once you've taught your dog during obedience to not only follow commands but to we use the command you know focus or watch which means look at me I like pretty much all the time and you constantly are rewarding the dog for for you know like they acknowledge something over there and then they look back at you and you're like oh yes good dog give your dog a treat so they start like oh something okay what do i do about it and they look back at you and you so they learn to just kind of ignore stuff there and stay more focused on you which is what we need them to do anyway and it Very does nice. help make them less reactive but again a, a lot of times they're just like a, a couple of dogs I've had that they get really excited when they see other dogs out in public and they really have a hard time focusing. So you have to spend a little extra time, you know, working with them. Like, you know, see that dog way over there? Okay, now focus on me and let's do some fun games over here and then slowly get closer and closer to where the other dog is until they can practically be sitting next to the dog and ignoring it. But it does take a while. Yeah. Well, and you know, that is one thing that spoke to me too. Um, in your book, you talk about how when you train, you break things down into smaller steps. And I think that a lot of times as humans, we tend to, we have like this big task in mind. And so we think, okay, I'm going to teach my dog this, this huge task, but you really are breaking it down into much, much smaller pieces to teach, correct? 
That's correct. Yeah. Well, it's like whenever people teach their dog to retrieve, you know, the, the, the goal is the dog picks something up and brings it to you. You know, you, you say, I, I need my phone. The dog goes, gets the phone and brings it to you. You don't teach the dog to go get the phone right off the bat. You teach the dog just to pick something up and hold it in his mouth for a minute and then pick it up and then bring it to you and then pick it up and put it in your hand nicely, you know, not throw it at you or drop it at your feet. And then you start <laughs> telling it to go get specific items and you, you have to name the items and, and then start working on more distance to where the dog will actually run off and go get it, not expect it to be right there next to you. And yeah, you have to do it in what we call you know, baby steps until the dog can chain it all together and just do it in one fluid motion. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, we always love to say to people, you know, there really aren't any good or bad behaviors. They're just wanted and unwanted behaviors. And you just have to be able to show your dog, you know, this is the behavior I want. And here's a behavior I don't want. Right. Exactly. And a lot of people make a mistake of accidentally rewarding the behaviors they don't want, because sometimes it's kind of cute sometimes. Yeah. But it's not cute every single time. And yeah, yeah you gotta jumping, really jumping is a very those. good example for that, right? Yeah, yes, jumping, jumping or even just mouthing or excessive licking. Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah, okay, sometimes you need the dog to not do that, especially if it's a service dog. You don't want them doing that to strangers. Mm -hmm. right, even, right. You know, even, even Sandy, you know, she liked to use her, her front paws to smack things. She was really, she was very, very pausy. And uh, she knocked over a toddler once. Kid walked right up to her, giggling, and just she's she sat there beautifully, and then just picked up her paw and smacked the kid, knocked her right on her butt. <laughs> Luckily, the kid just giggled, and the mother said it was okay. But it was <laughs> like I, I was devastated. But you know, everyone else was okay with it. But I'm like, oh, no, you're not allowed to pick your paws up more. I'm sorry. <laughs> Four feet on the ground. That's our that's our motto with the bigger yes. dogs. Four feet on the ground. Yeah, I was tell my I was telling one. Four feet on the floor. Yeah, or all four, four on the floor. On the floor that's, a, that's a good one. Four on the yeah, floor. All four on the floor. I think is how I usually <laughs> phrased it. That's pretty. And the older people recognize that. I got four on the floor. Now, yeah. would you say that your uh, your first service dog was your hardest to train, or did you have another one? Oh, she was probably the well. Was she out of my own person? Yes, she was probably the hardest to train. I've had some client dogs that have really been a challenge, but you know, just patience and constant work, and we, we make it work. And that, when you got your dog, sorry, when you got your dog, you also had behavior issues with the dog that you even had to fix. You just didn't get a nice, stable, high throw a ball. You had a dog that has separation anxiety. And that is a, that's really a hard situation to fix because it's a behavior. And you can't go exactly. forward until you fix that stuff. Exactly. Yes, I had to fix a lot of her behavioral quirks before we did anything. And my dog, Raven. She was also, you know, from the shelter. She was a shepherd and she was, she was a bite risk because she liked to put her mouth on her bit down. You, if she puts her mouth on you and you struggle, you know, you're going to get a little clipped with the teeth. And so I was really careful with her, especially around kids because she was very, very mouthy. So for the longest time, whenever we were around children, I would hold her mouth and hold her head while everyone else petted her until she realized you keep your mouth shut. I'll let people pet you. And so then she realized, oh, okay, I'll keep my mouth shut. And then I can let all these kids play with me because she loves children. She just really, really wanted to play with them. She just didn't know how to do it. So it took, a, it took months of taking her out and being around my neighbor kids. And luckily, most of my neighbor kids, I've trained them pretty well. So they, they knew what to do anyway. So it really helps. So I can train her to not open your mouth around children. Yeah. That's and, awesome. and, you know, you mentioned that in your book, too, and it's something that we train as well. So, uh, um, you know, sometimes you have to put your dog in a situation where they where they show the behavior that you don't want, because how else are you going to be able to train them to do the behavior that you do want? Right. Because I see so many people that would like to avoid the behaviors that they don't want. Yes, I, I see that a lot, too. You want to set them up to succeed but you have to give them the chance to fail. But you wanna make it as minimal of a chance as possible. So when they don't fail, you can reward it, reward it, reward it. And the dog realizes, oh, it's so much better not to do that. I should do this instead. It's just giving them something else to do instead of the behavior they were used to doing. Exactly, and they'll pick it up pretty quickly because they get the oh, yes. reward, whether it's a scratch on the butt or a pet on the head or a cookie. They figure exactly. it out pretty quickly. Yeah. Yeah. A couple, couple of good repetitions over a course of a week or two, and 
they figure it out very, very quickly. Yeah. yeah. So Myra, what, what do you love most about training service dogs? I don't know. I kind of love all of it. I, I, I love playing with the dogs because I get a great enjoyment out of learning with the dog and communicating with dogs anyway. But I also really enjoy seeing the dogs working with their people and doing what they're supposed to, you know, helping their people when they really need it. You know, like like when, uh, you know, a fire truck's going by and they can tell the person who's deaf, you know, don't walk out into the street. You know, we're not going there. There's something coming, you know, or, you know, telling them when their blood sugar is getting too high or too low and the dog's really doing what it's supposed to do and, you know, keeping somebody safe. That's. I and that has to be such a rewarding job to to bring you know a dog and a person together and not only bond as a as a dog and an owner but also as what you just described of some uh, a service animal that can truly you know save somebody's life or make somebody's life so much easier. Oh yes, it's very rewarding. I that's the best part of the job. <laughs> so where can people find your book? Uh, right now, just on Amazon.com. Yes, so please, yes, buy the book. It would be <laughs> awesome. Let me know if I, you know, if it, you know, if it's any good. And you know, I always tell people it's okay if you find like you know spelling mistakes and grammar mistakes because this is my first book. In there, if you want to send me a list of where they are, I'll fix it in the next edition. I swear. I just need to help need some help finding it. Yeah. So, and of course, we'll always be sure to share the link in the description below the video so that people can get your book right on Amazon, and it's available in paperback and hard copy correct that's correct okay it's a it's a great resource it really is i mean it's it's such a specialty book that normally people have to wait for so long to get a dog that they can they can keep it in house sort of thing it's just it's a great idea yeah this way you can get your dog and start training right from the very beginning and one else one other good thing about the book is i tried to write it so that i can tell you how to train if you're standing up or you're stuck in a wheelchair because you know it, the, the methods change just a little bit when you're stuck in a chair. Sure. Not a whole lot, but there's some slight differences. And I tried to reference that for just about everything where there was a difference. Amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you are definitely a great resource for anybody out there that's looking to train their own service dog. So uh, again, we'll share the link for your book. And if you are in the Phoenix area, um, I know that you are also the founder of a training facility here in, in the Phoenix area. Share that a little bit. Oh yeah, well, I, I found a, a trained dog training facility called All Four Paws Training. And it's actually located in Tempe. It's okay. off the Southern and the 101. Very so you nice. can always, of course, always go there for group classes or classes. Excellent. Well, thank you again. That was uh, great information. It was thank nice you. to see you again. It, it was <laughs> nice good to see you guys again, too. Good. Cool. Thank you. Take care. <laughs> All right. Bye, Bye. 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 Thank you for joining us today on People with Passion for Pets. We're Jim and B. Walker, and we share the adventure of life with our dog Apollo and Heidi. For more adventure videos, check out our YouTube channel, Modern Canine Vlog, or visit our website, www.mcs.dog. And until next time, keep your paws on the road.